Hello, this is David Morales, CEO and founding developer of VZ, Visual Zen. Our purpose, building better pathways for student and supporter success. Um, our topic today uh, was brought to my attention uh, due to our guest, uh, Sean. Good morning. Good morning. Um, our topic today is opportunity melt. Uh, it's a wide topic. It's a very large topic. Sometimes it requires someone to get their dissertation and do it on it. And that's why I have our guest, Sean. So, Sean, um, before we get into um, our list of items here to discuss, uh, we want to learn a little bit about you. Um, I know that you've been a client with us. That's been a great experience learning you. But when I read your dissertation, I learned a little more about what you were studying. I got so excited because I feel like as I talk to people, it's like they're starting to understand how all these pieces come together. And that is why I really would like to talk to you today. So why don't you share a little bit of how you got the role at the institution and talk a little bit how you fell into your uh, dissertation and why we're talking about it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me on the on the podcast. I uh, appreciate it. Um, Sean Ryan, I oversee orientation uh, at California State University, Chico. I've been here for about three years. Uh, prior to this, I was actually at California State University, Sacramento. So I've been within the, the, the California State University system for over 10 years now with orientation. And, um, and, and I'll kind of kind of build up a little bit about how I how I got here, but please stop me if I'm going on too long. But uh, a lot of it, and the dissertation I wrote, a lot of folks write dissertation on their own individual experience. Um, it's, it, I think my experience is interesting because I, um, I was in the, I work in the orientation transition field, um, but I did not have a successful transition the first time I went to college. Uh, first time I went to college, I lasted a full 90 minutes and then i left and and had never returned back to that institution so i'm originally from boston you beat me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, originally from boston uh, i was born and raised in the city and I, I rarely even left the city so i applied to one school it was the university of massachusetts in boston um it was about seven subway stops away from where i grew up and so i i went there and i was part of a um kind of like a like a mentioned before like a transition program like a summer bridge program and so i um i i, I first time i went to school was in was in june after i graduated high school so i didn't didn't visit it before so the first time stepping on campus i remember it was about mid-june and and some of the listeners might remember some of the feelings of the first time they walked on a college campus where you walk in the feeling of you know you see the buildings like the emerging adulthood it's a it's a thrilling feeling at least it was for me of going wow, like I, I made it on my college campus. This is, this is incredible. And so I walked right to, there was no orientation. Orientation happened after this, this event. And so I walked right in, um, just initially met with a, a professor. Um, he jumped right into an English lecture. Uh, I don't even think we did introductions. And we took a break at 90 minutes. And the whole time that I was in that lecture, um, I was thinking about how am I gonna afford this? How, how can I afford to pay for college? It kind of that like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, I, I couldn't think about anything else about what can I do. And so I, I left during the break and I was thinking, you know, how can I afford this? And not knowing the the resources that there, there were people available in the building right next door that could have answered that question, could have could have supported me, but not knowing how to navigate that new environment. I, I went to the resource that I knew that, that could help and support me. Um, and that was, um, I, you know, I went home and I called the first resource, and that was the uh, U.S. Air Force, because I'd seen commercials on there. I was thinking about joining potentially the reserves, um, and so I I called the Air Force, and um, this people might find this fascinating, but they actually they talked me into signing up, and so I signed up for four years active duty, and uh, never went back to to that institution. Um, they never called me. They never heard from them ever again. Um, and, and that was kind of the, the original, I can talk a little bit more about what Opportunity Melt specifically is, but that was my initial experience. And there are many things that stood out. I mean, I was, I, I was trained to be, um, I'd never flown on a plane before. Uh, my first flight was too basic training. And when I was signing up to join the military, the, the interesting story is that I, I said, you know, I, I don't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I talked to my neighbor and I said, hey, you know, I'm thinking about joining the Air Force. And they said, oh, you know, why don't you become an air traffic controller? Well, I didn't know what that was, but I heard it. So I kind of parroted that when I said, I'm going to join the, the Air Force. And they said, your eyes aren't good enough to be an air traffic controller. 
but you can fly in the back of this radar plane. Um, so f- folks know about it. It's called the, the AWACS radar plane. It looks like it has a little Frisbee on top. And so my first flight was too basic training. But but the point was that was really interesting is that was a $300 million aircraft. It took me about a year to train. It always stood out to me and, and it, about how did, did I feel at 18 years old to take this huge jump flying a $300 million aircraft, but it, but I couldn't be successful in college. They couldn't pass, you know, comp, comp one. Um, that I didn't feel kind of included within the campus community. What, why, why was that? Um, but I felt like I would take this huge leap of faith and just do this. And so those are kind of questions that have always been spinning in my head about how to answer and how to support students better within that transition. Well, th- that's a great lead in story because I think that story resonates with a lot of people, even of this day um, in the military community. As you know, I'm from Norfolk, Virginia. I see that's all those airplanes and kids all the time. We, we always thought they were submarine hunters. Um, <laughs> sometimes they are. Um, but uh, it was um, I still see that around and that's you know really relevant. Uh, but for the audience here is our audience is uh, multifaceted. Um, I've met people who are you know, 16, 18 years old listening to what we're saying because mm-hmm they have older brothers or, you know, sisters or family members, you know, in college. Some people are OLs. Uh, they want to follow higher education as a degree, uh, not just as, hey, I need a job. Uh, and there are directors here trying to figure out they've been transitioned into new schools. And after the pandemic, everyone's racing with the mass exodus. So there's a lot of even gaps of employment um, in uh, orientation and maybe OTR and the larger scope of how all this comes together. But we all serve a purpose, and that's you know for the student. And I think we can all throw terms like you know opportunity melt, summer melt, um, all these different things that disengage people uh, to go further. But since you have the PhD, I do not. Um, I would like to go ahead and ask you: Can you formally give us a definition of um, opportunity melt? Yes. So opportunity melt is um, most folks are, are familiar with summer melt. And so that's if you're not, that's kind of the, the attrition that happens typically over the summer months once a student kind of confirms their intention to enroll at your, your university and simply does not enroll in, in the fall semester. That's I think most people are, are, are familiar with that. And so when I was talking with educational leaders about summer melt, I, I realized the more conversations I had, more people did really didn't know what the phenomenon was of that. And, and m- multiple things would be lumped into summer melt. And so um, I, I started initially probably about four or five years ago asking the question, well, why do we have summer melt? What, what, what's leading to that attrition? And people couldn't give me an answer of, of where the students go. Um, some could say, you know, oh, we think they go to a different institution. Maybe they take a gap year, but n- no one could really define. And so I realized that my experience, the one I defined um, as, as someone that was, you know, college intending, fully qualified and te- college intending student um, that didn't enroll in the institution that I confirm my intention to enroll, but I also didn't enroll at any other institution. So that's really defining uh, opportunity melt is, is students that have been fully qualified, fully admitted, uh, college intending students that confirm their intention to enroll. But if you fast forward six months down the road in the fall semester, they're not enrolled in any institution. And so that was what I was trying to dive into. That's a kind of a subset of um, of just general summer melt. So um, summer melt, I, I, I get it, can be, can be lumped into students that applied maybe three or four schools and, you know, maybe June, July, they're still thinking. That's understandable. Or a life event happens and they say, you know what, I'm going to go to this X college instead of yours because, you know, I've made an informed decision that this is is a better opportunity for me. That That's fully understandable. But opportunity melt are, are more kind of dug into it are students that have, you know, wanted to go to college and wanted to go to your college. And then we've been able to kind of uh, get some uh, data from the National Clearinghouse to see about students that are actually enrolled. And, and from I've done this at two different school, two separate schools and looking at just summer melt in general, um, the population, the percentage of students that kind of would be lumped into summer melt, about 30 percent, roughly um, 25 to 30 percent kind of varies per year are within that opportunity melt. And so those are those are students, again, maybe join the military, maybe just don't go to college in general. And I've always tried to understand what happened. At one point, you, you went through the process, you applied, and you even said, I want to go to your school. And then six months later, 
you're not enrolled in any institution of higher education. What happened? And so every year I try to contact those students, what happened? And those have just been fascinating conversations. Um, most of those students we've identified that we, they're tough to get a hold of. Um, obviously some of them, you know, just, just won't return our calls or, but, but a lot that do the stories that they tell have been fascinating. I mean, it, it has been, I called your housing office and they said that there's a $300 deposit and I didn't have $300. And so I didn't, I, I, I decided not to go. And I go, that's, that's the barrier. No, typically it's, it's multiple things. It's, you know, I was selected for financial aid verification and, you know, I got the letter and, and I haven't talked to one of my parents in four years. I didn't know how to, how to get their income. Um, or I, you know, I got, I got this letter about immunization records. I, you know, I haven't, you know, my, my parents incarcerated and I haven't seen them. I, they have this information. Um, or I live with my grandparents. They don't have this information. Um, you know, I got a flat tire on my way to orientation. Orientation was mandatory. I mean, there's a lot of those little stories of some things that happened. And I, I realized that we were actually, we were not serving our students well, that we were serving, I think as an institution, we look at the students and say that want to come to it from, from an orientation perspective, who wants to come to our school? We'll send them emails, maybe a postcard. Um, historically, what we do that. And then we were serving the students that arrived. And I think for most of us, we were doing a pretty good job of the students that arrived and helping support them. But we're really missing, um, as one of my, I know you quote a lot of authors. One of my favorite authors is, is Malcolm Gladwell. And he, he, he kind of defines populations that are overlooked and misunderstood. And those were students that, that wanted to come to your school that never even made it to orientation or, or just didn't make it to enrollment period. So that's kind of the just general broad overview of, of Opportunity Mel. Uh, you know, I find it fascinating because it seems like we concentrate on a certain type of student that we want to push and, you know, kind of engineer and groom, you know, to get to school. But you have these people that somehow feel cut off. Um, and I was just reading a Harvard report. I only pick on Harvard report because it's one of the random things I get. Um, but it could be any report. It was over a million students that uh, first gen reported some when I said first gen reported. The report talked about first gen students already felt cut off because of the behind the curve. And then you threw the pandemic in there even further behind the curve. So even when you were talking about incarcerated or didn't understand, you know, didn't have technology. I keep talking about UTRGV when I had that experience down there about people who just didn't have access to electronic devices, you know. Mm -hmm. So the the time they find out about it is probably when they roll on campus, you know, for their orientation. They're like, I didn't know all of this. And then they sit in a room in, what is it, like early October maybe or, uh, you know, September, and the person next to them knows more about financial aid than they do. And that sense of belonging, whatever phrase you want to attach in that, you know, matter, student, you know, matters and all those things, you, you, you just feel disengaged. I said that earlier, that'll be a term that I keep bringing up, is that the engagement of getting them there has just gone away. And I want to talk about that later. Uh, because I think it's a, a big theme of why I want to talk about Opportunity Melt and what you have done. Um, because that uh, that feeling of not belonging, um, th there's some purpose behind it. And I think a lot of it's self-worth. The people didn't understand why I'm going to college anymore. Why do I need to get a job? Why do I need to do this? It's easier maybe to join the military if you get recruited. Um, and I like what you said earlier, and I'll ping back on that um, also. But I'll, right now, I'll say something very strongly. I think there's something to be said about the recruitment and the continued engagement that you know the military does have and how can they get people aligned and not just orientation but get them into a program to align them to maybe the contract they signed and you know, haha you signed one just kidding <laughs> but you know what i mean but there's something there that binds you know that experience which i think is important and so everyone listening today we're going to hit a couple topics we're going to talk about pre-advising uh, I'm going to talk about orientation leaders, uh, peer mentors, probably, you know, a decent amount. Uh, but I didn't want to lose uh, the foundation of why this whole conversation began. But I want to talk at the tail end of that, and that's your dissertation. What did, if you can explain when you have defended that and what did you learn afterwards? Because um, I think that's also impactful because people can go back and read it and they can find it, you know, search your name and such. But in your brain, in your mindset, what did you learn afterwards? Yeah, well, I can tell one thing I just just forgot to mention that I learned within the process is when I was trying to define what what like the summer melt and I, I would talk to, you know, deans and so forth and even even, you know, enrollment management managers and they were 
couldn't really, they'd be like, yeah, you know, students just don't attend our institution. We, you know, we don't know why. And we just kind of lumped them all together. So, so defining the term itself, I forgot to say about where that came from opportunity amounts. So a lot of folks are very familiar with the term um, equity gaps, you know, the, the outcomes of students and different, different outcomes based upon different student populations. And some might be familiar with the um, opportunity gap. And so that is kind of the, the disinvestment of students on the front end that lead to, to equity gaps. And so that's what we call opportunity melt because we took the summer melt term and then we took the opportunity gap at the beginning and basically saying if you invest earlier, it can help actually reduce that melt. So that's kind of the, the term that's where it came from, opportunity melt. But um, um, so the question was about the, the dissertation and, and, and how, how did it came about or, or how I, what I learned from the process? Well, first of all, is I love timelines because it makes the story easier to follow. Sure, sure. When did you defend your dissertation? I defended it, uh, it seems like so long ago, but it was actually this past May, so six, seven months ago. Okay, so six, seven months ago, I knew you way before that, and you had tools to help you that, you know, that we help you with, but that's outside the scope of right now. When you finished that, of all the dissertations I've read, and everyone knows all the podcasts I've done, you know, I've read yours, and I've read parts that I think are worthy of noting. Uh, what did you learn? I think people need to understand that you did all that hard work if they had the Cliff Notes version or something like, what did you learn afterwards? I, I, the, the biggest thing that I've learned is, is, well, specifically, some of our folks here might know this, but I, I learned that, well, there's a couple of things. One is that um, how much folks outside of our, our orientation bubble do not know about orientation. The more of the conversations that I would have it was still people feel that orientation is just a one-time event. A lot of folks feel like we just give tours. A lot of folks feel like we're just kind of rah-rah and, and, and that's it and kind of hand off. Maybe you show them some resources, that's it. They don't get that orientation one is a process, that there are multiple um, scaffolding of information throughout the orientation, throughout the full onboarding process. I've realized people, re a lot of folks just don't get that. Um, and so having to re-explain, having to translate up that, that our job are full translators of what is happening. And part of that is uh, through my dissertation was I uh, did a mixed method, um, kind of random control sample of students and we paired um, mentors. And we're trying to see what was the influence of having a peer mentor earlier in that stage. So, because we realized a lot of students that were saying that they were suffering that kind of opportunity melt were, you know, that they had some support through high school, they applied and around May, they maybe they graduated and they lost contact with some relationship within their, their high school or their network that could help answer some questions. So if they got that financial aid verification and they go, I don't know what this is, you know, in April, they could possibly go to their guidance counselor, maybe a high school teacher, Come around June, late May, that relationship maybe wasn't as um, consistent potentially. And so we said, what if we develop relationships earlier? And this was all based upon uh, the academic capital theory. And it's one of those theories that you know, really stood out to me that we could, we, that was very, very tangible that we could apply. It was really focused on population of first generation students transitioning from high school to college. It's providing, um, Timely information, encouragement, reassurance, um, includes the family, it expands their network. Um, you know, I can talk more about that, but the academic capital theory was a theory that I didn't know about either. And now we constantly include it, but it was, how do we develop relationships earlier? So if students have questions, even they're getting timely information, they're getting things explained to them. Um, if they have a question, they know who to go to. So we had peer mentors that were actually assigned kind of a caseload that they would meet at orientation. Welcome back, everybody. Hope everyone's awake. I had to go into my Superman phone booth here and change up so uh, we get some better sounding on this. Um, so let's continue with what Sean was talking about, um, us being uh, peer mentors being assigned. Yes, so um, we assigned, we, we did a random control sample uh, before of students, of, of incoming students coming into the, to the university, all first generation, and some were assigned to peer mentors, some were not. Um, the ones that were not were you know, had had higher attrition. Um, you know, we interviewed them. Similar things. I wish I needed a little little help and support. But the the experimental group of students that had a peer mentor, though, that was actually fascinating. And there was a lot of things that actually came about that um, 
we, we felt that students would probably need additional support during the, the transition, during the intervention. But we, we learned a lot of things like um, – <clears throat> Even um, advising, we learned things pre-orientation and even post-orientation. So we learned students that uh, at our institution need to take a math assessment to help place them in the correct courses at orientation. But oftentimes at orientation, once they were there, we usually assumed, okay, we enrolled you in the right classes. You know, you're, you're, you're good. And we weren't really accounting for the students that were changing their major after orientation. And so there were some that there was one student that was a uh, business major that didn't need the pre-assessment, but three weeks after orientation decides to change his major to an engineer. Thankfully, he was with a uh, one of our peer mentors that helped guide him through the math assessment process. But otherwise, he would have started the first day of school not knowing that needed it, not knowing which classes. Um, we had students that post-orientation had their, their classes dropped for low enrollment. And the peer mentor, there, there was no, there was no trigger on our side to follow up with those students and say, "Hey, your class was dropped." Um, the department would send out an email and say, "Here, go to your portal. Hopefully, they learned that at orientation. Hopefully, they remember that. Hopefully, they knew how to navigate and drop an ad." And, and a lot of them just did not. There was a lot of information at orientation, so r- really, was they needed reassurance? They had common questions. They needed support. The one day that, that our model, I should say, is, is, a, is a day orientation um, throughout the summer, that is simply a, a not enough uh, for our students, and they need no, more support at the front end and even on the back end. Well, you, you seem to be getting a lot of feedback though in, in the research, but you seem to keep on doing it. How did uh, You said you called these people. That was the beginning of the podcast when we started. Um, how do you follow up with these people? How do you know who to get in touch to to make sure that this data is correct? Yeah. Um, so what we would do, be following up with, stu- well, we did in a couple of ways. The first thing is we would, we would call them and it was beginning to build relationships with them. And so um, a lot of them, uh, you know, on social media. So we had our peer mentors create their own like professional social media accounts and they, they would send information that way. They'd also oftentimes do, I think it's about 30% of the students preferred not a phone call. They preferred a, um, like a, um, Goodness, I'm not a social media person, but a, like a, like a video chat through Instagram or whatever, and so they would do they would do do those types of things. But it, it, the relationship was built earlier throughout the process, so we weren't um, cold calling. We we sent the initial email. Hi, I'm your peer mentor. I've been assigned to you. I'm going to call you on this date. Um, so I'm not sure if you're answer, fully answering your question, but they, that's kind of how they were initially introduced, and they were constantly following up. So they had that relationship built with the student. Correct. Yeah, two ways. But since you said that, um, it's like the chicken and egg. How did you find those peer mentors? Oh, th- those were my orientation leaders. Those are my um, skill- skilled leaders, called. returners. Yeah. Okay. So because that, I think, you know, that's been the challenge of all these podcasts is understanding that you said that what you had started doing is using peer mentors to engage with the students and help. You got to imagine the audience here may not be doing that. So how do you even get to that level? You can say, okay, here's the magic. Social media, let's stage you up. But let's step back a second and say, how did you find these qualified peer mentors? How could you trust them? Like, what's your recruiting process? How did that all look? on getting your uh, team together. So for, for these folks, they had proved themselves the previous year at, at orientation and they were coming back. So I, I, I had those. Um, so, so with this, the new cycle that was coming in for the summer, like we're doing this summer, is we have about uh, 12 orientation leaders that had served last year that, that are coming back. So we're obviously we're in the process of recruiting new leaders as well. We have a mix of new and returning leaders. Um, our students have to take a, a class in the spring semester, and so they start taking that uh, next month. They'll, they'll start taking the class, the new leaders in training. And by about March, we can see, can we get a good feel for them at that point, um, that if they're ready to kind of take on that mentorship in April. So we have a few months in the initial training, even with the new folks, um, and, and the returners help mentor them. So um, that, that that's initially how, I mean, how we, how we kind of get the returners to, to lead that, those efforts. Correct. Because what I'm trying to understand is that customer service model that you're talking about, even you know, in the midpoint of a peer mentor, um, I'm going to even crawl back one step earlier to someone who doesn't even have that. We've met some schools mm-hmm. recently where they've asked us, like, well, how do we you know, begin looking at OLs coming back the year after they were an OL? Like, at what point did they become a peer mentor um, in doing that? Because what you're, I think I'm hearing you say and make sure the audience understands 
especially if we're giving awareness to maybe CIOs, VP of enrollments, other departments that don't know the importance of orientation, they need to understand the importance of this. Yes, we do orientation, but we do a heck of a lot more. We're grooming people who are orientation leaders, peer mentors who go into the other customer service models of all these other departments. Yes. You know, so I want to crawl back a step and say, okay, um, Sean, you have your first orientation session. You have zero orientation leaders. You start from somewhere you have staff. You begin recruiting for OL for next year, okay? So you find some you know, people that, the students in your incoming class that you like. You're like, oh, this is a great opportunity. They may mm -hmm. express interest. Um, you know, maybe they're in Greek life, maybe they're athletics, or maybe you know, they did some type of peer mentorship program in Upward Bound. We'll talk about that later. So you get that first cycle in yes. of orientation leaders. How do you pick those people to be peer mentors at your institution? We do. So, so, so after they've completed their, their first cycle of being orientation leaders, um, at that point, we, we have additional training, um, really, sometimes even during the summer of, of, of being a peer mentor for, for kind of future years. Um, they have to interview for the process come August. Um, and, and we do additional training. Um, at my previous school, we had like a one-stop um, uh, where we would actually kind of field out, you know, we spent all this time, effort training our orientation leaders and, and then we'd be like, okay, you know, we hope you get a job on campus. And so we were trying to work with them of getting a job on campus, specifically our one stop so they could train and kind of triage. And then we bring them back in the summer or, or, or kind of yes. in the spring. Um, so we'd be like, okay, we're going to kind of with you, but Hey, we're going to take them back, you know, with us. And so we, we, we still kind of had that same relationship with them, but we knew them well enough after the first summer, they had to reapply. And even through the fall semester, we still do uh, bi-weekly training, bi-weekly, bi-weekly -week, bi meetings where we gather their feedback too. I just did a focus group with them three weeks ago where I just, it's, it's so beneficial. I just sat down and asking questions, learning, how, you know, how are students, what could we do better in the transition period? Um, but, but we, we kind of go through, so we know them well enough by the time we pick them, we at least have a summer with them, if that makes sense. It does, because what I've just, uh, tried to describe before, and we'll go back to where we were after your dissertation, what you learned, because I felt like there was a gap, and my job is to help you know, follow the, the line of thought here, mm -hmm. because if, if I was someone else not in your position, I'd be like, uh, you lost me. Um, so if you're developing these peer mentors, it takes time. You're not yeah. just going to do it. But if you had to build out a business plan and present it to your VP or CIO or president or vice president or whatever going on, even admissions, you'd be like, look, we need a couple of years to rebuild our peer mentor program. This is how I think we should do it. We should start first by finding these strong candidates, mm -hmm. um, develop on an engagement path for orientation leaders. That's the new platform that VZ had built and that we've been doing for UConn and Sacred Heart and some other schools where we're pushing that out now of understanding that as you're doing the first interview round, not the second, but the first interview round to get those OLs, there's still a little bit of gap. And you said there's a spring semester where you know mm -hmm. you get them ready. Um, what, do you guys do anything between the first round of applications to when they start doing training in spring? Or is there about a two, three month gap where they don't do much? Um, they do, well, when they first apply, they apply usually around early, mid-October. Um, we do interviews Really, we have group interviews, we have individual interviews throughout the rest of October and November, um, and then we we hire folks in early December. Um, and we did we just did our first initial kind of meeting, um, and then we'll have kind of a welcome back once school returns. But the, but for that first class date in spring, it's mostly just two like social activities. Glad you're here. Now you're part of the team. Okay, uh, because one of the things that I've heard recently is uh, I keep mentioning his name, but Dr. Ryan Newton out at UCF. Yeah, uh, I was just about, listening to his. Yeah, yeah, they they've gone one step further um, of doing a year long. I, that's what he kind of talked about, but it, it's a risk of de doing year long applications, and which means changing the training model. Which mm -hmm. means it's not just October, it's not just this, to constantly build up that pipeline. Um, yeah. And what I, I was not arguing with them, I mean, nothing's ever perfect. You know, there's mm -hmm. a little bit of diversity everywhere. Um, but what I'm hearing from your program, you do have strong uh, peer mentors already. Um, you uh, cultured them and groomed them to, you know, as much as you can continue that pipeline. Um, but if there is that gap between a little bit between, let's say, November into January, February, there's <laughs> I'm going to use your phrase and use it wrong so you can correct mm -hmm. me. But there's also opportunity melt, too. You had these OLs apply. 
and you think they're going to be there and then boom, they're not, mm -hmm. or they're not what you expected in doing that. So uh, how do you guys combat that? I mean, is there constant engagement going on with the early OL stage? Yeah, there is. So we, we have a mentorship program with the, the returning um, uh, orientation leaders have kind of a, they, they also have a core group of, of of leader of new leaders, incoming leaders that are, are, are kind of trained uh, or, or initially in training. And so there we do a lot of um, mentorship. Even, yeah. Even that initial stage we do, we pair them off. You have questions. Um, this past year we created a video of what it's like, what skills did you learn? We've sent that out to them to try to see, you know, you, the previous years we could say, Hey, we're going to pay you a little bit more than the fast food place down the street. I can't do that anymore. I wish that I could. We just, now the minimum wage has gone up and, and we just can't compete with that. And so that's another variable that I think five, six years ago wasn't wasn't the case. Um, I think there's good and bad to that. I think that the, I wish that we could pay them more. We just can't by university standards, but we are getting students that are kind of self-selecting and saying, you know, I want to be a part of this because I know that this is going to be something better. So I, I think that the melt that we're getting of students that we do hire um, the past two years hasn't been as high as previous years. I think that's been kind of filtered out a little bit, but uh, there, there certainly is. And I, th I still think there's certain areas that we can do a little better, but I think that the, that mentorship piece and, and, and bringing them in earlier and kind of explaining, you know, the bigger picture of you, you know, you're going to be part of something bigger than yourself. These are the skills that you're going to get. This, this is the, 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 if you're not sure where you're, where you're going to be, you know, we're going to help you get that, that way. You know, there, there are folks in this room, we just had a first meeting and I'm like, some of you are going to decide to, you know, get a partner and, and get married. There's some people in this room right now. You don't even know that are going to be at your wedding. That that's the meaning of, of, of what this position is. And so, um, I think that's really, really helped, but I've really just uh, tried to train our returning leaders so well, and they've done a great job. They're the ones that kind of sell the, I would say sell, but really the ones that kind of provide that reinforcement that our new leaders need that, hey, I'm jumping into this new space and this is a good idea. This is why we, uh, you know, I, <laughs> This is where I go. I was tooting my horn a little too early, I think, with the orientation leader platform because we believe it. We did the purple cow. We did a whole educational session about it. But this only proves that the timing is crucial, that at this time, even though you have this student opportunity melt, whatever we're going to be calling it, we'll massage and shape it to be something soon. Um, but what you're talking about is intrinsic value. Like a lot of these people who are staying in, wanting to be OLs, wanting to be more, uh, mentors, have something special. Mm -hmm. And that is what you need to recruit, not just 10,000 people but yes. finding it, boiling it down. This is the golden time. I tell people that if you get the first intake, so the OL platform that we have is the simple early engagement for OL applications. So the first incoming student, maybe in, you know, when they go to the first orientation session, gets like a golden ticket. I know every school has that, but imagine you have a platform that intakes them in the full mm -hmm. life cycle of that OL is a year. What you're talking about, and I wrote it down here is then you do training for returning OLs. So that becomes a, a, like an HR platform mm -hmm. almost, where you're continually engaging and recycling them. That if people started focusing on getting quality OLs, getting them into peer mentors, keeping them in maybe like what you said, into the one stop back out, you know, into the grind a bit, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and things and bringing them back, that would begin helping a, a bigger purpose here. And this is why I had to go backwards and we're gonna get right into what you were saying is I think to attack opportunity melt requires a conversation outside the orientation bubble. And that was your phrase. You said there's an orientation bubble mm -hmm. where uh, influence and authority has been lost with other departments, other people. And it's time not to bring it back. It's time to say, this is so crucial to the bigger picture. And that's when I met with Nathan first from UConn and he was, he got it. He didn't get it at first. He didn't understand. He was like, why do we even need VZ when we're using an admission CRM that could possibly mm -hmm. do something? And that possibly do something turn out to be, you know, there's an opportunity to do something great when you give attention to orientation and see their key components. So now that we've gone back, I want to give you back the floor that let's say you've developed these peer mentors and you said now you're making them ambassadors through social media. That's a cool concept. Um, I haven't heard of many people really allowing these people to do that. But that that's cool that you're allowing them to engage early. That sounds like it. Um, and the part that I'm missing and I'm concentrating this whole season two is what I told you about beforehand is the pre-advising part. 
-hmm. you had mentioned that a little bit. I want to hit on that just a bit because we'll chapter this section most likely. Um, how are you guys there handling that pre-advising, making sure students do know a little bit with that variability that they may change their mind? Yeah. So, so in, in general, I think what, what's been helpful and more supportive is I think we're getting more buy-in, at least at my campus, from a campus community. We're one of the campuses nationally that our enrollment has taken a significant hit. We're down about 20% in the past five, five six years. So we're, we're a regional institution, Northern California. Um, I know some folks that, that, that are also, the enrollment has declined. And one of the good things about orientation is that, um, you know, Summer Mouth, I remember five years ago having a conversation with an associate vice president and the associate vice president saying, yeah, we, we want some summer melt because we can't support all, all the students. And that was the first thing that kind of clicked in my head. And I go, you don't know what summer melt means. You would not want students that are fully qualified, fully intending, wanting to come here to not come. You, you just don't get it. And so now I there's some that still don't get it, but they notice the urgency and they go, admissions can't do anything. We're not going to have as many students. What can we do on the front end? There are some folks that are saying their, their primary goal is just to increase kind of enrollment numbers. Um, but I'm just going from an ethical standpoint going, we should be serving these students earlier and, and, and often throughout the kind of the full process. So um, to answer your question, I think the buy-in from the campus community has been much, much easier because people are like, we must do something. Um, and there's more of a sense of urgency, which in the long run, that I think that's a great thing for our students because we can serve them better and people are paying more attention to that. Um, which has been has helped form really strong roots within our advising community. Um, my background is in, is in academic advising. I was an academic advisor for a while. I went to Kansas State University, which I think one of your previous guests did as well, and um, where they had a National Academic Advising Association. Um, and so um, I did my master's thesis on advising and supporting student veterans throughout the transition. And so we are looking at a lot of the, the pre-advising um, one thing is going, are we getting students in, in the right class? So there has been, uh, there was a study on our campus and we noticed that students that graduate in six years, if they have a strong GPA that first semester, that's the, that's the number one variable that they'll graduate in six years. So that leads to, well, who's putting them in the classes? What happens at orientation? Well, which classes are they putting them in? Historically, it would be like, here are your gen ed requirements and you can select, there's 50 here choose one. Now we're being much more intentional. How can we have that choice architecture be much more um, smaller and designed and more supportive and working closely with academic affairs, within um, academic advising, that, that orientation in general used to be about um, really survival, about, you know, here, you just need to choose a class that's going to satisfy this gen ed requirement, um, and here's how to enroll. Now we're trying to move it to a model um, and I know a lot of the schools are way past this, but how do you be more successful? Let's let's limit the options because because faculty have said been really really clear. We need to give students options, and I I've even invited them come into the computer labs, see how stressed they are at the computer labs. We can't be going here. You have fifth. They're not at that point. They're 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 going. You know, do I have enough financial aid? You know, am I smart enough to be here? They're not thinking about all these options. So we're trying to at the front end. Um, Build, this is we're going to do for the first time this this year is they're going to meet their their academic advisor prior to orientation. They're going to get some some, some videos and information so they know these people beforehand. We're kind of we're, we're extending that that process throughout the the, the the relationship building process with their academic advisor. Um, they're getting some information. Here are some classes. Do a little research. We're going to talk to you more about them when you come to orientation. But before they wouldn't get anything until they arrived at orientation. We throw them a huge menu of options. You you got about you know twenty minutes. Choose one. We hope it's right and we hope it's successful. And and it just it was not student friendly. We want student focus. So we're doing that earlier, limiting the options, being more intentional, being more supportive, explaining the process um, or, or earlier and often. I think throughout the whole process. It's very interesting you say that. Um, some people who know us as a company, and I've been. Literally, people come up to me. It's like, how'd you guys come up with this stuff? Like, do you guys have like a secret room, like everything like that? I was like, no, we listen to our clients. That's why we've been around for almost now twenty-two years. It's twenty-one years in last October. Is because we listen to the insights, and not many of our clients 
could articulate what you had said because I think that goes back to that bubble. It just that wasn't on their plate. You know, they didn't mm-hmm. understood they had that much governance, maybe, you know, mm-hmm. or authority. Um, I want to pick on a couple of our clients that talked what you talked about. Um, one of our, I keep talking about Christopher Newport University, one of our early clients. They have learning communities there. Um, their school funded uh, VZ to be around this long because uh, the registrar and people understood that if they had a first semester planning sheet, uh, they could do earlier course registration. They would do pre advising before they come to orientation, hook up the right advisors, and kind of feel like, you know, which are the ones that are floating and, you know, maybe outliers in the sense of where they want to go. But you can kind of tell someone who is, this is the major I want to stay with because of what you said. You have someone talking to them, someone feeling them out, looking at something technology driven, like in our product, because uh, they do learning communities there at CNU. Mm-hmm. But that could be every school's a little different. But as they're staging and putting these people in, there's also checkpoints of, you know, contact. Uh, we have this one client that I'm going to, it's not, uh, I keep saying the word secret because like, you and I have some military background. <laughs> but it's, a, it's just, we're going to be releasing in early spring um, an interview with one of our clients that solely uses our product for advising. I had no idea. Yeah. I thought they were all orientation based. And they're like, no, David, like this is what we do, even though that is a nice component of your product. So the technology that we've had has been around a while to help pre-advising, but that's also why I'm doing the insights and asking you, Sean, is what can we do to leverage technology to help with that pre-advising, not just doing, finding the advisors, engaging them. How can we do that? So, so one of the things that we've been trying to do, and we're, we're going to really scale this, we started this last year and, and, and um, we, we, I've been wanting to do this, and this is one of the reasons why we actually selected VZO because it has the capability to do this, but was creating a, a survey of giving an inventory of students um, prior to their arrival at orientation. And so as an academic advisor, um, and again, at the schools that I work with, um, I would I would know absolutely very, very limited information about my students prior to their arrival. I might have access to their transcripts, um, but I wouldn't know who they were. And so... Elizabeth has been wonderful on your end and has really helped us create and craft a survey to students once they arrive, uh, once they register for orientation. And we're asking them, why did you choose your major? Why did you choose the school? What is your your future career? What are your ambitions? And we, we, you know, what are your concerns during the transition? We capture that and we're sharing that with the advising community prior to their arrival at orientation. Um, my wife is an academic advisor, so it's been really, really helpful to see. We have long conversations at the end about what, you know, what, what, what is working? What do you want to see? So I'm hearing from her end too, if this was helpful, you know, can, can you craft the, the message a little bit different? But we're trying to capture that information before and I'm sharing it with the advisor. So when the advisor comes in, they're not going, who are you? Tell me about you. They, they know some information and then they're building upon that information, which has been, which been wonderful. Now we're also trying to look at, um, I think the next phase within the transition period is we've been, we've been very reactive. Higher education in general has been very reactive to society. But how do we become, with the data that we have, be more proactive um, with, with our students and more supportive with our students. And what I mean by that is, um, historically, we would rely on the student to uh, self-identify whatever their challenge was and then navigate the bureaucracy to get their answer that they needed within our world in an unfamiliar environment. So what's my issue? Do I have an issue? How do I find the answer? And how do I find the person that can get me that answer? What we've been trying to do, and part of this information even from VZ, is capturing information, some data from students, and sometimes realizing that the student has an issue before they even know it. Um, so I mentioned even I mentioned financial aid verification, for example. Right when students are verified, we used to just kind of send an email out to students and say, hey, you've been verified. And we, we tried to do a little follow-up, but not as much. Now the peer mentor can follow up with them. Um, we're asking students, what concerns do you have? And as soon as those results come in, my peer mentors, my orientation leaders are looking at that information and saying, okay, you mentioned finances here. Have you not filled out the FAFSA? Or are you concerned once you get here, an on-campus job? Let's address that now in April, May, June, as opposed to waiting to orientation or opposed to waiting until September, and then you're trying to figure things out. So it, it's been a lot of information. There's a variety of things that we've created, these early alerts and early indicators for students, um, which even include, you know, are you thinking about changing your major? Uh, 14% of our students change their major from when they apply in October to when, um, after they attend orientation. 
14 or first year students. So we're capturing and go, wait a second, you applied as a, um, a you know, a, a criminal justice major and now you're changing to biology. Let, let's, I just want to make sure, or you, you checked mechanical engineering, you apply, but now you're mechatronic. Did you just like switch? Did you miss that? Or do you really want, do you not understand what that is? And my orientation leaders, they have enough training to at least kind of look at the catalog. Go, okay, here's some information. Here's your future career path. So there's a multiple of indicators. Um, you know, one other thing is housing that we're using. We're asking students, you know, do you have secure housing? Um, and historically it's been, you know, if they didn't apply, we can't serve all of our students. We serve about two thirds of our first year student class on housing and the other third we can't. And we just assumed, well, if you didn't, you're going to figure it out on your own. No, now we can get that data if they go, no, I don't have a, a secured place. Let's follow up. Let's call them and go, you know, do you need help um, supporting, you know, you're getting, finding a place or, you know, what 17, 18 year old knows how to sign a lease? I certainly, certainly did not. And so if we know that information, you say, hey, I'm kind of need help and you don't know that yet. We're taking that information. Um, sometimes they're giving it to us. Sometimes we're pulling data that we have. You know, we know students from Southern California need a little bit more help and support. So we're, we're doing we're doing that as opposed to waiting for the students to contact us and say they need help. But a lot of that has been with Elizabeth and what she's created with VCO. Well, what excites me about this, you know, <laughs> I was talking to someone uh, recently on the airplane, and uh, I think we're passionate about this because we actually love what we do. And so, you know, they're like, oh, why do you keep saying this is boring? And it's just not that you and I think it's boring. We like it. We're just, you know, this is not common, you know, discussion mm -hmm. here. Um, one of the things that we are trying to get better at at our company is we provide a tool called PATH, which is an advanced task list. And everyone who's watched any other episode knows what it is. Our clients know what it is. The difference is conceptually a lot of them, a lot of people don't because they don't know how to use it. And you're talking about engagement. And one of the things we were talking about and engagement is multi-layered. And I want to come back to you, but I want to segue like proper, just kind of go off in a weird end because you said it. I love always paraphrasing people. You said it um, that, you know, we met some people who do content delivery like icebreakers and, um, when you're saying, I don't know how to sign a lease. Well, that one of the questions is, do you know how to do a doctor's appointment? Do you know how to get your immunization records? Have you checked to see if you, you know how to renew your license? Anyway, these icebreakers and content delivery is only one layer of multiple things. Engagement to me is exactly what you just said. And people are like, Dave, what do you mean by engagement? Like having a forum and they just fill it out. That's one version of engagement. But having some data, some predictive analysis, mm -hmm. and then someone react in a proactive way, which is mm -hmm. kind of ironic, um, of a peer mentor saying, uh, your immunization records haven't been done. Your financial have done. I'm going to reach back out to you. Can I help you? You know, encouraging through engagement, I think that's, you know, something that people are starting to understand is like, wait a minute, I can build that ol to be a peer mentor now you're talking about pre-advising bring advisors in like how do i even do that because it sounds to me what you just said that some of these peer mentors may be advisors too i mean is that the case or not the case they are um they used to be called peer advisors and i've changed i changed the term um because i didn't think they were actually the, 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 the term advising, at least on our campus and with me, is a little bit more sacred. Like my, my wife's an academic advisor. She, I mean, she's, she, she, she works and counsels students. Um, she knows that it's not a kind of, it's a very interactive process, not a transactive process, a transactional process. And so um, they do some initial advising. You know, you need these, these areas. They can kind of do the kind of gap advising um, but I, I try not to use the term advisors with them because I feel like that's that's really uh, with our professional staff. They do much more. They can they can counsel and go. This is what mechatronic engineering versus mechanical engineering. Th th this is what the the skills that you need. So, you know, some of our orientation leaders can do some of that, but um, not to the degree of our professional advisors. But they do a, kind of that initial triage advising. I would say. Well, one of the questions I have, and uh, again, I have a lot of them. Um, and hopefully we have some time. We may have to do another one after this or get interrupted. <laughs> um, that you're saying you're assigning these people to the students. And the way our product was originally built, we have a module called event grouping. And that was used for the day of events, not, you know, pre-advising before in April and, you know, March. Um, so the way people would assign OLs, um, advisors too, because our heavily advising based ones, would, uh, there's a, an algorithm in our product that, you know, can sort by different mechanisms and then attach people to the, you know, the right groups uh, based on whatever model. But what I'm hearing is you're doing this assignment earlier. And what I don't understand on the business side is how do you do that? How do you assign them earlier? Yeah, it's, um, 
it, it's been a little bit this and actually this is one of the things we've learned from our dissertation is and, and I've done you know some discussions with students of going how, how would you like to be paired um, you know is it is it on an identity that you hold and if so which one um, we've kind of lumped in in general and there are some students that have said they'd like to be paired by by identities and there's some that said had no preference we noticed um, our kind of first round we were doing just by major and so we take we have an orientation leader that's a business major we have a new student that's a business major and we noticed that you know sometimes that i mentioned before majors could change students weren't fully aware that wasn't as key ingredient of, of the connection as geographic location and so if we have some of our orientation leaders we we, there, we have all of them thankfully from different parts of uh, california if we have someone from san diego we knew as that was more important um because they're going hey is anyone else from san diego traveled up and how was that and and, and finding that connection so our first thing right now at this point has been geographic location unless a student specifies i would like to be paired so otherwise and otherwise we're doing it we're doing it manually um so there might be a better process but that's how we're doing it right now taking our leaders and kind of grouping them that way I mean, what I'm hearing is, is that you're, you're keep, you have to keep putting different values into those variables because it's going to change every year, or whether they want to be by identity, geolocation. Yeah. Uh, maybe like learning communities, I, they, it's not perfect. No school is perfect, mm-hmm. but you can always get a couple percentage points better, better than none. That's what I tell you. know, zero, you, know, you can always get better than zero. Mm-hmm. Um, and assigning that is, is important. So that pre-advising, uh, that component of shaping the student down this path uh, and that guiding aspect's pretty cool. So you get them there, right? I'm walking through a story here. Sure. You did all this recruitment. We call it the admissions transition. Um, and then you guys get them, and you massage the data, and you assign your peer mentors or you know whatever you're doing there. It gets into April, and then it gets to the day of enrollment. And I, the, my second question is coming. I just got to stage it so it makes sense. So they did the pre-advising. They kind of know what they're doing. You're engaging back and forth, making sure that they're there. You come to the date of the orientation when they're enrolling for classes. What happens right afterwards? Meaning that little gap after the student says, "I'm going to take these classes," to the first day of class. So kind and of that. Po- got- yep. No, sorry, I, inter- I think I interrupted you. Oh yeah, it's just that post enrollment piece, like right before mm-hmm. they get in the class and when they select their classes, because we're still talking about that gap of people changing their mind, which you're talking about it for many different reasons. How are you engaging after you help them register for classes? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so at our, our model, which I think a lot of folks model, they, they register at orientation pay, pay, typically sometime during the summer. Um, for our students, our first year students come in the month of June, maybe a little bit of July um, to, to an orientation session. Um, and so, yeah, they could have a good month and a half before school even begins. And so we're following up. Our, our peer mentors have a checklist of items that we've identified that there's certain areas that are probably a little bit more important in April, and there's certain things that are more relevant in, in, in August. You know, in, in, in August, in April, they're wondering, do I have a housing room on campus? In August, they're curious about the bed sheets, you know, those types of things. So, you know, can I bring a fridge into my room? So we have a, a, a checklist of, you know, discuss this, discuss this with them. I mean, they can clearly go off topic as, as things needed, but one of the things is following up with your major and having students, okay, you came to orientation. Um, do they, do they have questions about meeting their major at orientation? Do they have a question who their advisor is? Are they questioning about um, their major? Is there, is their career ambition still remain the same? Um, ha- we have kind of a post orientation homework, like take a look at the, the catalog again. We've introduced it a couple of times. Do you have questions about which classes you're taking? Um, do you have questions that's a 100 level class versus a 200 level class? Do you know what that means? So, our, our orientation leaders are, or peer mentors are intentionally engaging with them a couple of times from that uh, orientation attendance to the first day of class. Well, how are they doing that? Are they making phone calls, text messages? Phone, phone calls, yeah. They're doing, they're doing phone calls. Um, they're doing phone calls. I, and re- one of the things they ask them is um, some, of, some of you Zoom. I don't think the students prefer that as much that, that um, Instagram – um, has been has been popular. Um, I, I didn't want my orientation leaders to use their personal Instagram, so they created that professional Instagram account. Um, but so initially, they're they're engaging earlier, like you know April, sometimes even May, calling up, and then they ask the student, "Do you prefer this? Do you want a phone call? Do you want to do you want to do do it on Instagram and things like that?" And so so they they use that the modality of the student preference throughout that transition. 
I don't I don't understand how anybody in the audience who's listening who's not an orientation professional does not now aware of how powerful what's going on here. If you're not giving resources to because the first thing in my mind is thinking is you don't have enough staff members to actually do this for every single student coming in. It's impossible. It's one to many. Um, and so you're letting a couple slip through the cracks and there's obviously engagement getting better. You're lowering that melt percentage, right? I mean, your goal is to get better from that huge percentage that you had said. Um, so that let's go that, uh, post orientation experience. Okay. And we haven't even touched supporters yet. And I think we're going to carry this, um, podcast a little longer, uh, than expected. So everyone listening, we will chapter this, this part out, you know, in a bit. But I need to understand the student post engagement. So you you get into move in or check in, right? You know, you get to that experience when they come in on campus. What's the handoff for these peer mentors to the students? So they've been engaging with this one person. Yeah, so so that's part of it too, is that you know, we at the front end is our focus of, of the opportunity mouth and let's get them to orientation. If students attend orientation, there's a ninety eight percent chance that they're gonna be present at census. So from an enrollment perspective, that opportunity mouth is getting them there. But it's also, there's a lot of students that if we didn't have mentors, they would still make it. They would still be present on campus. Um, my first primary goal is accessing, getting students the information and support they needed earlier and often. But the, there's some students that would get the, get uh, kind of go through that transition and they could probably do it by themselves, but they would struggle. And that first day we are realizing a lot of them, their anxiety was through the roof just because they're going, I don't know what happens next. I don't know how to make those connections. Um, yeah, I made it to campus, but where is my building or, or whatever that is. And so the handoff itself is we work with a variety of different different um, support partners that we have. Some have mentoring programs throughout the, the fall semester. So we're working closely with them. Um, we have an EOP program that we handed off to EOP right after orientation. So um, they, they do kind of a bridge program that really starts right Kind of a little bit post orientation, and so there were some that we hand off right then, and it's like EOP, they've got them, they've got the central point, we got them to that point. There's a lot of students that are unencumbered, um, and we support them throughout the kind of our census period in the first first semester. But there are um, so we really work with different partners. Some are like um, we realize a lot don't start either they don't have capacity until the first day of school. And so one of the, the things that we've been translating up is saying students need help before that. Some students aren't going to make it to that point. And so it, to answer your question, I think it just depends on um, like, like housing. Um, they start really about the first week before school, um, really doing some engagement before. So we're kind of getting students to that point and then we're working with them. Okay, you got them. You have an assigned RA. Gotcha. We're kind of hands off. We're here if you need us, but that's your new person now. So it, it just depends. We're working with it with multiple dynamics on campus. Yeah, I always had the weirdest, uh, you know, interesting bits to put in. But uh, I listened to Jocko Willink, uh, the retired Navy SEAL. And uh, he had made a joke that when he was, you know, going to after buzz and everything, and um, he's like, he wrote a note to his, you know, superiors and everything. He's like, your brainwashing is working. Don't worry. <laughs> um, the concept of is, you know, that constant guidance and help that isn't as harsh as going into the military, but the effectiveness of different, you know, onboarding programs, even at companies, Google mm -hmm. and everything, when they bring someone in, they don't just let them fend for the wolves. I mean, they know exactly how they, you know, they need to fit in for success. Mm -hmm. um, and when I go back to that Harvard report, I literally clicked on a link, went somewhere else to figure out what they're doing in Fort Worth. Uh, and te Texas is doing all these crazy things too. Um, there's this one school system begging for more, um, uh, like you're calling them peer mentors, they call them like counselors, you know, mm -hmm. uh, guidance counselors and everything like that. They're asking for help. And it goes back to what I said to you before, is like now we need to become advocates, ambassadors, you know, not only the OLs ambassadors of your university, but now we need to help the OLs, we need to help the peer mentors, we need to help this structure. It goes back to the customer service model. Um, and so I, I think I'm just saying that for a reason here is that that constant engagement needs to exist at all points. And that layer we're just talking about as students. So most schools have that already, but it's not that strong. They need to get better at it. You gave some great ideas. And eventually at one point we need to go back and just discuss um, you know, what the training actually looks like for OLs. But I don't know if that's the secret sauce of every university mm -hmm. or is this, you know, everyone's flying by the seat of their pants and he's just trying to figure it out. Um, but along that journey, if we go back to the beginning, this is where I'm bringing in supporters. So you're talking about engaging um, with uh, students early on and getting these peer mentors. 
what what do supporters look like? Family members, coaches, you know, people that are trying to help these students that are not guidance counselors. And, you know, more geared towards what you're doing at university, or if you want to go even further, just from a philosophical point of view, that what do the supporters need to be doing to help the OLs, to help these peer mentors? Yeah, I think it's, um, you, you know, the, you talk about initial training. I'll get kind of the, to, the, to the supporter model, but the initial training is, is that we spend considerable time, especially that first two weeks of our class, talking about who we are, what our mission, what are our values. And, and I explain to them that concept of our t- opportunity melt. I share my story of students that wanting to come. And we, we, we really discuss, and throughout the, the class, of what is our North Star? What is our guiding light? And that is supporting all students that want to come to this institution throughout the transition. So um, one thing, actually, I want to be just clear with, with the audience, I think they kind of get it, but is that we really train our orientation leaders. We're not salespeople at all. So we're not coming in. If we contact the student and they say, you know what, I've decided to go to this, this community college instead because for whatever reason, if they're making an informed decision, um, we say we wish you the best and, and, and we want to want you to succeed. We're trying to really, and that's, that's pretty rare. Most of the students are going, yes, I want help and I need help. Please help me. And so, but that's our kind of guiding light is really to engage, interact. And, and we've had to spend time with our tra- our leaders of, of explaining what that process is, because some of them say, you're just contacting students because you want more more money for the for the students to come in. And I go, and that's, that's not how it works. We're a nonprofit school. It, like if we get more students coming in here, I don't get a cent. And I'm going, we're actually supporting students to help transform their lives of getting them in, in the whole um, onboarding process. But part of that academic capital theory that I was describing earlier, um, one of the things I like and appreciated about it, but because it, it actually welcomes, it's, it's a model that welcomes the family and incorporates them and works on educating the family. And so we have, um, we have, we have models that we have, uh, we try to bring the parents in as much as possible, try to educate them. Um, I know some folks, you know, are, 10 years ago was kind of keep the, the parents at a distance. Now we're realizing there probably needs to be a balance of that, of, of bringing them in, educating them, helping them how to, how to be a supporter earlier. So we have, um, we've even reduced our, we used to have a fee for, for, for parents that was $90 and we go, that's way too much. So we cut that in half. So uh, we're trying to get more parents engaged earlier. Um, one of our first calls, I was identifying kind of student populations when they apply to the university. Some of them say if they're a Spanish speaker, their, their, their house, they're coming from a Spanish speaking household. They're one of our first priority groups that we contact the students that are coming from a Spanish speaking household to inform them that we have Spanish speaking orientation. So we're trying to let them know before, just, hey, find it on our website and hopefully you, you, you enroll or when you, when you register. So we're trying to do that again earlier and often using some information that we do have at our disposal. So um, hopefully that was answering your question, but that's, that's kind of how we're trying to bring them in earlier as well. Yeah, it does. And I'm still going to harp on this thing. I do it in my company all the time. We just did it this year, proactive calling. I mean, you're proactively mm-hmm. calling based on this you know, analysis. Uh, but what I'm leaning on is – the uh, supporter aspect because when we built the supporter platform it wasn't just by mistake mm. it was intentionality and it wasn't ba- some directive that came from above somebody says holy crap how can we just do this better because it's not about as you said it's a, it's a small it's not small i keep saying that it's just, it's a percentage that's noteworthy you got to mm-hmm. pay attention mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. because we are talking about and i think um i have stats background i'm pretty sure you're pretty good at math um and it seems like we're attacking this model from like a negative point of that's what i've heard from other people from a negative point of view you're talking about what's not working what's not working why don't we just talk about what's working what's working great that's why we have different models different dissertations different things and different mm. things today we're talking about opportunity melt we got a sophomore slump mm-hmm. we got different disengagement steps along a four to six year path not just orientation so you lock down orientation you got that right what's the next thing after orientation has gone what support model do most people have? And generally it's their home, their friends, their partners, mm-hmm. their coaches mm-hmm. or somebody, their Absolutely. church. I don't know. It could be Absolutely. anything. So training and onboarding supporters is just as crucial, yeah. not for the beginning part to handle op- opportunity development, which it would help, mm-hmm. but also when they're sitting in class looking for a mentor, that's not a mentor assigned to them, a mentor, you know, from a job. Mm-hmm. So I want to get your take on the supporter level of engagement And you're saying you're training these peer mentors, but before I kind of shape too much in your head, I just want to get your, your real feeling, your real passion about how, what level of support should we be training and giving to supporters? 
Yeah, I I think we should be doing a lot more, and I and I I, I have seen I've, I've talked to Elizabeth about the the parent supporter new module that you're releasing. I think it's great. I think it I think it's needed. I think it's important. I think we should because you're exactly right that that many of students right now, especially this new incoming generation, is looking at kind of I think they've described it as the co-pilot as the, the parent and supporter, and we can do be we can do be doing a lot more to to educate, inform, and help them support their student throughout the transition process and even after. And, and I don't think that we're doing, at least at our institution, I don't think we're doing as much that, as that we can do of, of bringing them in, welcoming them in and going, hey, this this is, you know, six, seven months or six, seven weeks down the road. You know, your students probably or even earlier going to feel a little homesick. How do you deal with that? How do you how do you support them? There, there's such a significant influence within our students uh, you know, model of success of coming in and being successful. And, and, and I, I just don't think in just in general, our field is doing as, or there's some great things that are going out there, but I think we can do probably more, at least on our end. Yeah. So I, I understand that not everyone has a support system and we mm-hmm. can pretend that we don't, or maybe you yeah. physically don't, you know, um, but a large portion of people do. And I was joking around in my head, uh, before I said it to Sarah Dodge, we did a video podcast that hasn't been released yet uh, on name tags and way bigger than that. <laughs> it's just a concept of, you know, how do you engage physically with the person, you know, the first time you meet them mm. and name tags are a very important piece yep. of that. And on the name tag, you can have the OL and the parents want to know who the OL is because they want to get in touch with them probably later. Um, but what dawned on me was that, if you're creating these guest tags and you're, if you have, you know, the parents and supporters coming to a session, which is not a large portion, but it's a, it's a sizable amount. Sure. And there's, even if they're stuffing their own name tags, it's the parent helping stuffing the name tags is a concept, the concept supporting the experience. If there's not enough OLs, not enough peer mentors, I think it's even more crucial to get the supporters to help, to help the OLs do sure. the job they need to do. And like what you just said, if I drew a curve of the engagement, I think I'm doing left to right here. I'm confused. But um, the curve of you know that early engagement of a student in their brain, their motivation may dip at certain points because they're worried about school and worried about graduation. Where the curve of engagement for a parent is when they start looking at what the bill will look like. Or yes. what the anxiety, will be, the anxiety levels, that's what I'm trying to say, are different. Or the excitement levels are different. They need to be attacked at different times. So that checklist you're t- saying that you have for students, there should be a checklist for parents of saying, we, we need to call them. We need to speak to them. Did you find the, the video we did on Money Matters or something like that? So I wanted to get your opinion on that. Yeah, no, I think that that's vital. But but I think w- within that is that you're absolutely right. There are some students that don't have a strong support network, and there's some that do, and they're not coming to orientation either for a variety of reasons. But it could be finances, could be they can't get time off work, and trying to do a better job of reaching those, those parents and supporters that might not – physically, whatever the orientation looks like, um, is that I, I think there are some schools that do a wonderful job of what, once parents arrive and, and welcoming them, but we can't forget about the parents that parents supporters that aren't actually physically coming or, or want to be a part of it. I think the checklist is a great idea. I, you know, we get in con- uh, calls a lot of times from parents about, you know, what, what does my student need to do next? How can I help them? How can I support them? And, and if we should be, you know, allowing the student to, to grow, and, and, you know, be educated and have, um, you know, taking the lead on some things, but allowing, but having that balance of allowing the parents of keeping them informed and allowing them about how they can be better. How can they, how can we coach them to coach their student to be, to be kind of take the lead on some things, but to, to do that. And I do love the new, the new model that has, that kind of lays things out, has a checklist, has what to do next. Um, I've also, also used the, um, you know, there's some videos that we've created for, for parents and guests about, you know, explaining what FERPA is, how to be supportive. Um, so I, I, I do think that when just in general, that's one thing that at least my institution and a lot of institutions can do a little bit better with, but not forgetting the population that doesn't come to, to orientation as well. Correct, because yeah. uh, part of it, and I, I will lean back on the, the main topic in a bit because I think I, we can have some strong uh, conversation about that. But as I mentioned, because a lot of that orientation bubble you're talking about, you had mentioned earlier, too, that they're inheriting family programs and they're inheriting mm-hmm. things that may have not been in their bubble. A lot of schools have them already. I mean, that's not the point. Mm-hmm. But a lot of them didn't. And yeah. um, we did this whole episode that we're about to release on Family Weekend, how two of our clients inherited Family Weekend. They didn't know what the heck they were doing, but mm-hmm. they were great at event management. 
But what happened was, is they were like, I don't know what to do. Not, I mean, they knew what to do, but that's not their job role. That wasn't supposed to be on their plate. Sure. But that post engagement piece brought attention to them because if they did such a good job at in person or even virtual orientation or giving mm -hmm. information mm -hmm. to parents, now Family Weekend has become part of that instead of the orientation bubble, the overlap of the transition of power, who has authority over what area. So the orientation bubble of not having enough attention on there, I, let's call that bubble of plate, has now grown bigger with the introduction of pre-orientation, now post-orientation support or post-orientation now being family weekend yes. and creating that sense of engagement. So you're right. A lot of parents don't go to orientation. I sat there. I This is probably the 18th time I've said this. At UConn, I sat with two lovely ladies, and they were speaking to their husbands on the phone, or uh, one of them, you know, a, a family member. But they were saying, I missed the orientation. What was going on? So a lot of people who would still want the experience, but they can't, you know, be there in mm -hmm. person. Family weekend is more scheduled like an event. It doesn't mean everyone needs to go. But part of that level of engagement throughout the year can be marketed earlier. So that supporter engagement, if you get them earlier enough in that summer orientation for a student, I would think mathematically that would help opportunity metal some sort. It would help mm -hmm. lessen yes. all these things by getting that tail end, uh, uh, tail end of parent engagement. And again, I would love your thoughts on that. Yeah, it, it, no, absolutely. I, I think so too. You, you know, including the support network that the student has and informing that support network, I, I think is vital. Um, and I think just as we're, we're trying to outreach and connect with the student earlier, bringing the family in, educating them, I think, I think is only a win-win. It, it's also crucial as, as, as I'm just thinking of, we're having this conversation about the, 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 the changing dynamics of, of higher education and what's going on right now. There's so many things that are changing um, and, and many in a good way. Um, some in, a, in, a, in, a, in just kind of visioning where we're going a, a, as a field. And one of the things that we're going to start seeing a lot more is students that are coming in from either a reentry standpoint or um, or a larger adult population of students that are coming in potentially for the first time. And even including, we, we use the term supporters of coming in. We've seen um, increased amount of uh, students that are coming in with, with strong partners. Uh, we, we saw them before, but we're seeing an increase more. And I think, I, I think, you know, the next you know, 10, 15 years, I think we're going to see more of that population grow. And so, you know, not just in the framework of just having parents, but I think supporters, partners, also inviting them through the process so they know what their partner's going through and how they can support them throughout the transition um, is also a vital point. Okay. Uh, I'll leave this alone because I feel like I'm, I'm bouncing on this one pretty hard. Yeah. Um, so, but I do have a personal question. You said uh, reading and you brought up Max, you know, such, uh, what are you reading right now? Oh goodness. Um, reading, um, I'm in the middle of, uh, atomic habits. Um, oh, trying to remember that. yeah, great, great book, um, that, that I was reading and I was just reading, um, Oh goodness. I was reading a great book on, on higher education and the, the name is just slipping me. I can, um, I think it's the, is it the enrollment cliff is what they call it. It was, it was, it was, it was just, it was a great discussion of, um, I, I like to read a lot of kind of higher ed books regarding, um, kind of the field, um, changes. And I, I can, I can kind of look it up really quickly, but it was a great book about kind of where we were, how higher education has, um, encountered challenge change, uh, where we are and where we're going in the future. A lot of people think that, you know, we've gone through multiple cycles of change. Um, the fifth wave is another one by, by Michael Crow, the president of ASU. I'm, re I'm in the middle of reading that one too. I read everything by, by Michael Crow. Um, I think he's actually fabulous, um, author. Um, but, but it talks about the, the, the cycles of, of higher education and, and, potentially where we're going in the future as we move and as we make this change. Okay, cool. I'm always interested because uh, here comes my silly question. Are, are you an audible guy or you got to have it in your hand? I've got to have it in my hand with a Kindle because I like to highlight with a Kindle and make some notes and, um, and I can easily find it via Kindle as opposed to kind of that, that physical page. I, that, so I Kindle and no, no audio. I always read it. Yeah, I just I got an interview uh, with um, uh, Chelsea from Ahab. Uh, she's at RIT. And she's like, I read 111 some books. I'm like, wow, it's amazing. She's like, some of them are on Audible. And I this is the first year of my life where I chose, and uh, I I still do Audible on the side or whatever, but I chose to read one book at a time. It had to be paper. And man, that is a challenge. My backpack and you know everything got heavy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so back uh, to your dissertation just a bit, but really more of a crystal view. So all this research that you've done, um, you had mentioned something in a previous conversation that you're trying to apply what you've learned from, that's why I asked you this, uh, what you've learned with using our technology at VZ. Um, but not just with our technology at VZ, but just technology in general. How do you see the next two, three years of what you have learned and research and spent a lot of time doing and what you're applying? Like, what are you looking at uh, in two, three years, just to give someone else some insight of uh, you know, what Sean thinks? Uh, the next two or three years in regards to the things that I've learned from the dissertation. Is that what you're, yes. that what you're referring to? Correct. Opportunity melt and you know, what you're applying. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's a there's going to be a lot more attention focused in that, that pre and post orientation space. I think there's going to be a lot more um, mentorship. I think that you, as enrollments have continued to decline, um, I think folks are going to start looking and realizing that um, – Re- recruitment um, enrollment management is just not in the admissions office it, it extends much further beyond that and folks are going to go what can we do and so we have highly qualified you know fully intentional uh, uh, college intending students that want to attend your institution not only does it help with enrollment management it helps prepare them to be be more successful once they arrive so you talked about that, that sophomore slump i think we have more investment on the front end so we're supporting, we're mentoring students, we're, we're investing them in what they need, um, what other needs are, how do we connect them earlier? Realizing that that first kind of initial interaction should not happen at orientation. So we should not know that, oh, you, you played, you know, this, this instrument in, in, in high school or you, or you like, you know, this hobby. We shouldn't be going, hey, at orientation, here you go. Take a full look. We have all this. Find it for yourself. We should be going. I think it's the responsibility of the institution going, hey, David, you gave us this information. You like you know, reading books on leadership. Well, guess what? We have a club. We're going to tell you that we have that club that you can get together. We have a book club on leadership, for example, or or you like knitting or watching this. So it, it's that that kind of data and being very much proactive before students even arrive on campus. Um, I think that's something that we're going to realize. I think the the relationships matter, that we need to build them earlier and often um, to, to connect with students. I would love to see, and I know some schools are doing this, but right when a student says, I want to confirm, you know, I've been, I, I confirm my intention to enroll, um, what, what has, what, um, how can I be paired with a mentor? I think the last thing I think is, is also crucial. I think we're going to start seeing um, us reexamining what we're doing and are we causing any intentional barriers um, for students? So, f- for example, um, there are some schools that still require a, a, a housing deposit and, and valid reasons, understandably so. But if we know students are getting financial aid, what, why why are we allowing them not to even apply to the, This is some schools I know that they can't even apply to get an application Um until they pay $300, even though we know they're going to get financial aid. Why can't we waive those things? So, and, and some of your, your listeners might be saying, yeah, we already do that. Well, there's a lot that still do not. And and looking at those barriers, we up until um, two years ago, if you were a student that was conditionally admitted, so we, we didn't have your official transcripts, we had, we had your unofficial, you couldn't register until you had your official transcripts in hand. And we realize, why are we doing that? We know that you've passed, you have an unofficial transcript, let's allow them to enroll. So I think it's a lot of re-examining administrative barriers that might have been valuable, might have been worth it 30 years ago, but now they're not. And so what can we do better to support the full student experience and, and really centering the student and understanding them? I, the last thing I'll just say is that I, I don't think we've done a great job as an institution of really listening to our students. I think we've been assuming students what they need. And what I found is extremely valuable is we do this a couple times a semester. We do this in the, in the, in the fall and the spring is we do focus groups, not just surveys, assessments. That's great. But really doing focus groups and bringing students in and asking them, you know, how are you experiencing the transition? What could we do better? And they build off each other. And, and I mentioned before, we call every student that that does not attend our, our institution, but specifically the ones that don't attend any other institution. And go, why? What 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 happened? What can we do better? That has been probably the most enlightening 
uh, the conversations that I've had with students and really gaining what their perception is. But so, so I think a lot more listening, understanding barriers, and what can we really do to support students earlier and often throughout the transition. Yeah, I actually hope we had talked about alumni before. And I just, uh, this is the business side of me. I'm like, I, if I were a donor to a university, I'd want to hear Sean talk because I want to hear that stuff because, you know, mm-hmm. I, want, I want to see that. Um, yeah, uh, we don't have enough time to go over alumni right now. One of the things that I've been asking people is we're concentrating all this time on the onboarding process. Very important. Okay. You have some skills, you have some research, some knowledge, some years, experience. If I took Sean and said, Sean, I'm sorry, your new job right now is offboarding students. That's all you can do. You're not no longer dealing with enrollment and onboarding. You're dealing with job preparedness, um, mm. life things. Um, I, I'm going to ask you, if I flipped your world upside down, how would you handle it? Just crystal ball. You don't obviously need to know the answer. But what's your first gut? Like, what are you thinking? My, that's your my, job. Yeah. My, well, my initial, my initial gut is – is, is, is there's there's a connection between all so if you talk about offboarding a lot of students are coming into the institution and going like you know, you know they, wh- wh- where do they want to go and how do we be a process to it so I, I my initial thought is is bringing players to the table and going there's 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 connections even with offboarding and onboarding you know if they're coming in well what do they want to graduate what's their future goal students are coming in overwhelmingly you know coming in orientation saying I'm going to school because I want to do this after college so I think there's well, let's let's bridge the the connection earlier with uh, career centers. They're you know advising curriculum earlier. So I, I, my initial thought was I don't know if I answered your question, but more finding that connection. I think we're just so connected, um, all of our departments together of supporting student success. Because I see it as a big yeah. relay race, a positive one. You got to pass the baton, but for a purpose mm-hmm. of the baton to get to the end, not just like I'm dropping it and you someone else needs to pick it up type of thing in the sophomore slump. Uh, one of the things that you said earlier is an indicator, and you said one of the indicators was GPA. But how do you know that's even an indicator until you see if that person has graduated, right, or has offboarded? And that's where I think the tail end in the future, five, ten years, is going to be so much more powerful than it is right now, mm-hmm. is looking at did we do a good job at orientation and how can we evaluate ourselves? So yes. one is evaluating every year, looking to peer mentors, yeah. but looking at, hey, if we started this year, 2022, uh, Sean, you did a great job in orientation. Enrollment's great. And then we look four years later, what the hell did that program do? What are we holding to the fire? Mm-hmm. Like, how would you mm-hmm. assess yourself? Like what, what other indicators other than GPA you think would be there? What, what are things that you're seeing now that if someone would create, uh, they would do their dissertation based on this conversation of saying, wow, he said GPA. What, what else we could be looking at? Yeah, I think one of the, one of the biggest things is is inclusion. I'm seeing a lot of students wanting to feel included right up, right off the bat, um, and and that is finding community. Um, that is you know f- resources, appropriate resources, especially mental health resources. Students are asking for it, and a lot of them are leaving the institution because either they don't know the resources exist, um, they they haven't found community earlier. Um, as more and more students are doing, you know, online orientation, I think we're going to differentiate how, why are students coming to our institution and, and, and what separates us from, say, an online degree? What does that look like? And so I, I think um, probably for I think there's been a lot of work on this, but, you know, how do we help students find their community earlier, often? Um, you know, students are that's one of the things students are saying is, you know, I, I didn't feel included right at the beginning. OK, how can we do that earlier? What, what, what can we do? And so I, I think that's probably, we're seeing it now, but we're going to see even more so of students going, I really wish I would have had this resource earlier. Um, I would have found community earlier other than just kind of GPA and academics. I mean, you said mental health. That is the number yeah. one response that everyone yeah. says. And even uh, I did my Florida tour. I went down to Florida Gulf Coast University, you know, tapped it down there. And um, I, we were just in a golf court. I love that when people take me on the golf So when I come see you guys, I want to go on a golf cart. So just like, you know, I don't know if you can drive <laughs> or not. Um, but they took me around campus and their wellness center was huge. And mm. I didn't understand what resource they had. Like if I were a student coming there, I probably wouldn't even understand I had access to those resources. Mm. And I think you're right. I think part of not just a sense of belong- a community is very important, but also what resources, I think you nailed that one. Uh, what can I get from the university other than mm-hmm. a degree? Mm-hmm. Can, uh, how can I help myself become a better person? Because we all know health has got to be number one. <laughs> sure. I mean, you, you can't function without, you know, doing any of that. And then number two is, you know, having a, that guided, that guided path, you know, through all those steps. Sure. 
Well, Sean, I know we, we said a lot here. Um, we're definitely going to round that corner now. Um, I definitely want to invite you back, um, hopefully in uh, January, February, for the further discussion. Uh, we're going to nail out some things uh, more concrete with OLs and pre-advising and kind of uh, everyone to look in their crystal balls then. And we're going to make kind of like a contest, like what do you see yourself at, <laughs> you know, at the end of the year, just so we can share insights. Uh, that's why we have the VZ Network. That's why we're bringing everyone here together. So in due fashion and tradition, we're going to end off on the one thing, uh, just to be clear. You just need to align it to you know, our purpose, building better pathways for student and support of success. But it doesn't have to be on topic. It could be anything that just came up right now or something you've been thinking about. So again, Sean, thank you very much. And in three, two. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking of, thank, again, thanks for, for inviting me and thanks for being here. But I'm just thinking about, I, my mind just coming back to access and getting students access and that, you know, you mentioned Harvard a few times within this and that, you know, we don't we don't all have to be Harvard. I don't want to be Harvard. I want to be about social mobility. I don't want to be about focusing on how many students we exclude. I want to be about how many students we include within the process and help succeed. And that's where I think the new mindset is going. And that's where my mind is going about how to be more inclusive with all of our students that want to come to college. So.